Chapter Seven of Trail of the Hawk. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Vendetti, MikeVendetti.com. The Trail of the Hawk by Sinclair Lewis. Chapter Seven. He saw Gertie two hours after he reached Rollyman, for a week's stay before going north. They sat in rockers on the grass beside her stoop. They were embarrassed and rocked profusely and chattily. Mrs. Cowles was surprised and not much pleased to find him, but Gertie murmured that she had been lonely, and Carl felt that he must be nobly patient under Mrs. Cowles' sight. He got so far as to sigh, "'Oh, Gertie!' but grew frightened, as though he were binding himself for life. He wished that Gertie were not wearing so many combs stuck all over her pompadoured hair. He noted that his rocker creaked at the joints, and thought out a method of straightening it by braces. She bubbled that he was going to be the big man on campus. He said, "Ah, rats, and felt that his collar was too tight. He went home. His father remarked that Carl was late for supper, that he had been at Gravigand and Plateau, and that he was unlikely to make money out of all his running races. But his mother stroked his hair and called him her big boy. He tramped out to Bone Stillman's shack, impatient for the hand-clasp of the pioneer, and grew eloquent for the first time since his homecoming, as he described Professor Fraser and the delights of poetry. A busy week Carl had in Joralman. Adelaide Benner gave a porch supper for him. They sat under the trees, laughing while the dimly lighted street bicycles whirred, and box elders he had always known whispered that his guest of honor was Carl Erickson, come home a hero. The cycling craze still existed in Jerolman. Carl rented a wheel for a week from the Blue Front Hardware Store. Once he rode with a party of boys and girls to Tamarack Lake. Once he rode to Walkman with Ben Rusk, home from Oberlin College. The ride was not entirely enjoyable, because Oberlin had nearly two thousand students, and Ben was amusedly superior about Plato. They did, however, enjoy the stylishness of buying bottles of strawberry pop at Wakaman. Twice Carl rode to Tamarack Lake with Gertie. They sat on the shore, and while he shied flat, skipping stones across the water, and flapped his old cap at the hovering horseflies, he babbled of the Turk stunts, and the banker's car, and the misty hinterlands of Professor Fraser's lectures. Gertie appeared interested and smiled at regular intervals. But so soon as Carl fumbled at one of Fraser's abstract theories, she interrupted him with highly concrete Jerusalem gossip. He suspected that she had not kept up with the times. True, she referred to New York, but as the reference was one she had been using for two years, he still identified her with Jerolamon. He did not hold her hand, though he wondered if it might not be possible. Her hand lay so listlessly by her skirt on the sand. They rode back in twilight of early June. Carl was cheerful as their wheels crunched the dirt roads in a long, crisp hum. The stilly rhythm of frogs drowned the clank of their pedals, and the sky was vast and pale and wistful. Gertie, however, seemed less cheerful. On the last evening of his stay in Jerolamon, Gertie gave him a hayride party. They sang, Seeing Nellie Home, and Merrily We Roll Along, and Shawnee River, and My Whole Kentucky Home, and My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean and in the good old summer time, under a delicate new moon in a sky of apple green. Carl pressed Gertie's hand. She returned the pressure so quickly that he was embarrassed. He withdrew his hand as quickly as possible, obstinately to help with the unpacking of the basket of ginger ale, chicken sandwiches, and three cakes, white frosted chocolate layer and banana cake. The same group said good-bye to Carl at the M and D station. As the train started, Carl saw Gertie turn away disconsolately, her shoulders so drooping that her blouse was baggy in the back. He mourned that he had not been more tender with her that week. He pictured himself kissing Gertie on the shore of Tamarack Lake, enfolded by afternoon and the mystery of sex, and a protecting reverence for Gertie's loneliness. He wanted to go back, back for one more day, one more ride with Gertie. But he picked up a mechanics magazine, glanced at an article on gliders, read in the first paragraph a prophecy about aviation, slid down in his seat with his head bent over the magazine, and the idol of Gertie in the afternoon was gone. He was reading the article on gliders in June 1905, so early in the history of air conquest 
that its suggestions were miraculous to him, for it was three years before Wilbur Wright was to startle the world by his flights at Le Mans, four years before Berloy was to cross the Channel, though, indeed, it was a year and a half after the Wright's first secret ascent in a motor-driven aeroplane at Kitty Hawk, and fourteen years after Lidenthal had begun that epochal series of glider flights which was followed by the experiments of Pilcher and Chanot, Langley and Montgomery. The article declared that if gasoline or alcohol engines could be made light enough, we should all be aviating to the office in ten years. That now was the time for youngsters to practice gliding as pioneers of the new age. Carl guessed that flying would be even better than automobiling. He made designs for three revolutionary new airplanes. Drawing on the margins of the magazine, with a toothmark pitted pencil stub. Gertie was miles back, concealed behind piles of triplanes and helicopters, and following surface monoplanes, which the wizard inventor C. Erickson was creating and ruthlessly destroying. A small boy was squalling in the seat opposite, and Carl took him from his tired mother and lured him into a game of tic-tac-toe. He joined the Turk and the wire stringers at a prairie hamlet. Straggly rows of unpainted frame shanties, the stores with tin conical false fronts that pretended to be two stories high. There were pig pens in the dooryards and the single church that had a square low white steeple like the paper cap which labor wears in the posters. Farm wagons were hitched before a gloomy saloon. Carl was exceedingly glum, but the Turk introduced him to a University of Minnesota pharmacy school student who was with the crew during the vacation, and the three went tramping across breezy, flowered prairies. So began for Carl a galloping summer. The crew strung telephone wire from pole to pole all day, playing the jokes of hardy men, and on Sunday loafed in haystacks recalling experiences from Winnipeg to El Paso. Carl resolved to come back to this life of the open, with Gertie after graduation. He would buy a ranch on time, or the Turk and Carl would go exploring in Alaska, or the Orient. Law? He would ask himself, in monologues, law? Me in a stuffy office? Not a chance. The crew stayed for four weeks in a boom town of nine thousand, installing a complete telephone system. Southeast of the town lay rolling hills, as Carl talked with the Turk and the pharmacy school man on a hilltop the first evening of their arrival. He told them the scientific magazine's prophecies about aviation, and noted that these hills were of the sort Lilienthal would probably have chosen for his glider flights. "'Say, by the great Jim Hill, let's make us a glider,' he exulted, sitting up, his eyelids flapping rapidly. "'Sure,' said the pharmacy man. "'How would you uh, make one?' "'Why, uh, I guess you could make a frame out of willow.' have to. The willows along the creeks here are the only kind of trees near here. You'd cover it with varnished cotton. That's what Lilienthal did, anyway. But darned if I know how you'd make the plains curved, cambered, like he did. You've got to have it that way. I suppose you'd use curved stays, like a quarter-barrel hoop. I guess it would be better to try to make a Chinook glider, just a plain pair of superimposed planes, instead of one all combobulated like a bat's wings, like Lilienthal's glider. Or we could try some experiments with paper models. Oh, no, thunder. Let's make a glider. They did. They studied with aching heads the dry-looking tables of lift and resistance for which Carl telegraphed to Chicago. Stripped to their undershirts, they worked all through the hot prairie evenings in the oil-smelling, greasy engine room of the local powerhouse, in front of the dynamos, which kept evilly throwing out green sparks and rumbling the mystic syllable um, 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 to greet their modern magic. They hunted for three-quarters inch willow rods, but discarded them for seasoned ash from the lumber yard. They coated cotton with thin varnish. They stopped to dispute furiously over angles of incidence, bellowing, Well, look here, then, you muttonhead. I'll draw it for you. On their last Sunday in the town they assembled the glider, single-surfaced, like a monoplane, twenty-two feet in span, with a tail and with a double bar beneath the plane by which the pilot was to hang, his hands holding cords attached to the entering edge of the plane, balancing the glider by movements of his body. 
At dawn on Monday, they loaded the glider upon a wagon and galloped with it to a forty-foot hill. They stared down the easy slope, which grew in steepness and length every second, and thought about Lilienthal's death. Well, shivered the Turk. Who tries it first? All three pretended to be adjusting the lashings, waiting for one another, till Carl snarled, Oh, all right. I'll do it, if I got to. Of course, it breaks my heart to see you swipe the honor, the Turk said. But I'm unselfish. I'll let you do it. Brr! It's as bad as the first jump into the swimming hole at spring. Carl was smiling at the comparison, as they lifted the glider, with him holding the bars beneath. The plane was instantly buoyed up like a cork on water as the fifteen-mile headwind poured under it. He stopped smiling. This was a dangerous living thing he was going to guide. It jerked at him as he slipped his arms over the suspended bars. He wanted to stop and think this all over. Get it done. He snapped at himself and began to run downhill against the wind. The wind lifted the plane again. With a shock, Carl knew that his feet had left the ground. He was actually flying. He kicked wildly in the air. All his body strained to get balance in the air, to control itself, to keep from falling, of which he now felt the world-old instinctive horror. The plane began to tip to one side, apparently irresistibly, like a sheet of paper turning over in the wind. Carl was sick with fear for a tenth of a second. Every cell in his body shrank before coming disaster. He flung his legs in the directions opposite to the tipping of the plane. With his counterbalancing weight, the glider righted. It was running on an even keel, twenty-five feet above the sloping ground, while Carl hung easily by the double bar beneath. Like a circus performer, with a trapeze under each arm, he ventured to glance down. The turf was flowing beneath him. A green and sunny blur, he exulted, flying. The glider dipped forward. Carl leaned back. His arms widespread, a gust of wind struck the plane head-on. Overloaded at the back, it tilted back and soared up to thirty-five or forty feet. Slow-seeming, inevitable, the whole structure turned vertically upward. Carl dangled there against a flimsy sheet of wood and cotton, which for part of a second stuck straight up against the wind, like a paper on a screen door. The plane turned turtle, slithered sideways through the air, and dropped, horizontal now, but upside down, Carl on top, thirty-five, forty feet down. I'm up against it, was his only thought while he was falling. The left tip of the plane smashed against the ground, crashing, horribly jarring, but it broke the fall. Carl shot forward and landed on his shoulder. He got up, rubbing his shoulder, wondering at the suspended life in the faces of the other two as they ran downhill toward him. Jiminy, he said. Glad the glider broke the fall. Wish we had time to make a new glider with wing warp. Say, we'll be late on the job. Better beat it, PDQ. The others stood gaping. End of chapter 7